if it's a truly an honor to, to be able to speak um, before you, um, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, of course, uh, I've, I've been here a while now, uh, and I've been thinking about, you know, would I have this opportunity to give the post-tenure talk? And, um, and now that it's finally arrived, I'm really excited to sort of share what this first seven years has been for our program. And um, I, I was really excited, and I made kind of a real busy, what's that? Uh, yeah, it is. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Speak louder. Or, or pull, pull it up. Okay. Okay. How about that? I'll try. I'll try to project. Um, so, my the goal of this talk is to just share the experience of this first seven years and tell you what we as a group do. Um, and, and I want to highlight the group that, that has been involved in this research and to emphasize that you know, the credit belongs to them and they're sort of the reason that you know, I get out of the bed in the morning. And when you come in and you start these jobs, you know, um, you're really excited about the, the collaborators and the other um, colleagues in the department, but these are the folks that you spend most of your days with, you know, and it's not the undergrads that are in your class, although they're great as well. So having a good group is essential, and so I've been extremely fortunate in that regard. And so I'll try, as I go along through this talk, to give the appropriate credit to the people um, as we get through this stage. Um, we are very spread out all over fungi, and sometimes I don't really have even a good perspective of what it is we do except fungi. So um, I try to do this word cloud of all the abstracts that we've published since I got here. And you know, there's a bunch of details, but the thing that really pops out here is species. And for me, that's a really good thing because um, I think species are fundamental units and, of course, ecology and evolution. And I really care about species and their natural history. And I think that in our lab, we study a great diversity of species and that each species we get the privilege of studying can tell us something different about the way nature works. And so I embrace the study of many and diverse species. Um, and I have, uh, of course, a role as a curator at the university's herbarium. And I have to say these are extremely huge shoes that I have to fill. Um, you may not really know it, but th the University of Michigan was probably the premier academic institution for mycology in the 20th century. It's because we had really great uh, people here like Alexander Smith who wrote countless monographs and collected over 100,000 mushroom specimens, um, greats like Fred Sparrow, and of course, Louis May Waymeyer, who was a specialist on perenomycetes, which are these really tiny fungi that make flask-like fruiting bodies, but um, he was an expert and wrote the book on them. And so what you see here is sort of like the, the amassing of collections over time. And you know, there is, of course, this really huge uh, spike in the mid 20th century which leaves an amazing legacy for us to try to follow up on and, and, and utilize this resource. It's only now really being appreciated because of the technology that we can, can study it so well. Um, and so, um, indeed, I'm, I'm very humbled to be in this role. So um, I'm going to just tell three stories about our research, and they're united by this parasitism. So um, when I first came here, if some of you were, were there at when I interviewed, I, I talked about mushroom mating systems. And um, I, I do like to study those, but for some reason, I've just found myself attracted to studying parasites um, because it allows me to um, interact with more people. So everybody's got a parasite problem in their system, more or less. <laughs> and we um, will. We'll talk about this sort of three arms of our, our lab in terms of fields of research. Systematics is a major component, and we're looking at the systematics of one particular group. Um, we'll talk about those as being obligate pathogens that have no choice but to kill. And then we'll talk about our population genetic work where it's focused in on this amphibian killing disease, and we're tracing back sort of the origins of the disease as well as the mode of recombination. And then lastly, we'll talk about some of our experimental evolution work where we're um, looking at opportunistic fungi. So these are fungi that 
really don't want to kill. They didn't evolve to kill, but they happen to be in the right place at the wrong time. Okay, so um, just launch into this first um, this first aspect, and it, it's about um, what it is to be a, a fungus, and um, and so it, our goal in this is to is to reconstruct the early steps in diversification of fungi, particularly the phylogeny, and so the phylogeny is essentially the roadmap of diversification that happened way in the past. And our goal is to understand that roadmap and then to look at the markers along that roadmap that allowed sort of these evolutionary transitions to blossom or that facilitated these, these novel adaptations that give us some hints about the ecology. Um, so the, we'll start with a very simplified view of fungal phylogeny going back to 1996, at that point we already knew that fungi and animals were sister kingdoms and um, they're both heterotrophs and they um, will we'll highlight this aspect, which three aspects we'll highlight on this tree. They share the presence of chitin, so chitin is used by both kingdoms. Um, but animals, unlike fungi, uh, phagocytize their food, so they eat their food whole. Fungi do something different. They digest their food by secreting enzymes and then take up small molecules through, through a cell wall barrier. And that cell wall barrier is known to be made of chitin. Okay. And then in this old system, there were four phyla. And um, the first phylum was united by the presence of a flagellum. They lost their flagellum. And then they became these other um, three phyla. So it's a very simplistic view. Molecular data more or less ruined this whole picture. Um, I'm going to start at the base and sort of like this first identifiable fungus form. This is a chytrid. So this, this has all the things that you would want in a fungus. It has um, a nice cell wall. This is a sporangium that turns into spores. The spores are able to swim. They're flagellated. And then it has this um, ramifying uh, rhizoidal system. And this is the system that grows invasively into the substrate secretes the enzymes, digests the foods, and take it back up over a cell wall. And it shows this sort of polarized growth, so this apical growth, which is highly characteristic of fungal mycelia. So it has everything we would expect in a fungus, and it has to be a fungus. OK, so flashing back to about 2003, when I started my first postdoc, um, one of the main goals was to put the chytrid fungi into you know, a taxonomy, a phylogeny. Okay, And particularly, we were wanting to test the hypothesis that all the chytrids were a clade, or alternatively, they weren't monophyletic and the flagellum may have been lost multiple times in the fungi. Okay. And um, here we published this massive phylogeny, um, and we were able to show basically that chytrids were not monophyletic. And we'll just we'll focus in on, there were at least four independent losses of the flagellum. And I'm just going to focus in on um, this, this one branch right here. So here's fungi right here, and here are animals, okay? So this is the supposedly the very first branch in the fungal kingdom, and it unites this chytrid fungus with these two things that are on extremely long branches, which are called microsporidia. And those were basically characterized as protozoa at the time. And here's a picture of, of the microsporidian spore. It's non-flagellated. Okay, so here was a very interesting finding, which is that there's this first, very first branch in the fungi, and it unites this sort of uh, protozoan thing with this chytrid thing. So um, let's explore what's going on in that clade. First, I'll talk about the biology of rosella, um, which is very interesting. It is an intracellular parasite. It reproduces with modal spores, and those spores swim and find its host. The host is always a water mold. Okay, then the spores insist, which means they form a cell wall on the surface of the water mold. Then they send in this, um, this infection peg and they inject their protoplasm into the host. The protoplasm then takes over the entire host. The host then forms its uh, cell walls that are then turned into parasite uh, zoospores or parasite resting sporangia. It's a really uh, remarkable system in, wit in which it completely takes over the host. Um, cellular metabolism. 
Okay, very obscure, though, and only seen by guys like Fred Sparrow, who just kind of looked at stuff all day long in the microscope. Okay, so Rosella and, Microsp and Microsperity, we published it in that paper, but we weren't really able to say with a slam dunk that this was the relationship on that very first branch in the tree. And indeed, other people published papers that said, no, this is wrong. They're in the zygomycota, the microsporidia. Microsporidia were very hard to place because of the long, um, fast rate of evolution, basically. So are they, are they related? I mean, what, how are they compare? So they have very different means of spore um, discharge. So I talked about these spores, which will produce flagellated spores when they germinate. And then there's these uh, microsporidia spores which produce this crazy uh, proteinaceous polar tube that injects the protoplasm into the host. Okay. These spores were known to be chitinous, and these um, before were unknown to be chitinous. And the hosts are completely different. So microsporidia are really mostly known from animals, and rosella is only known from water molds. Okay. And um, when they grow vegetatively, they grow inside the host. And that growth is without a cell wall. So that's a shared characteristic. But rosella, interestingly, was um, reported to undergo phagocytosis, which is essentially like it, once it gets inside the host, it starts pac manning up the cytoplasm of the host. That, that's the observation. And uh, microsporidia lack mitochondria. They have the smallest genomes of all eukaryotes. And, um, Rosella has a completely normal mitochondrion. Okay. So there, that hypothesis was for a while that there was this, you know, this clade at the bottom of the fungi, and they were really obscure. But things got really interesting. Here's a sort of my cartoon of what was happening, uh, or, uh, and you, you basically. <laughs> You pour into the sequencer dirt, and you get out gold. And it, <laughs> we're still, fortunately, in this golden era. Um, but what one of the highlights of this era was this, the publication of this par paper in Nature, Discovery of Novel Intermediate Forms Redefines the Fungal Tree of Life. This was a very controversial and splashy paper. And I'm going to um, explain what they found and describe their novel and intermediate and redefinitions. Okay, what was novel about the forms they found? Es essentially what they did is they kind of scrubbed all of the metagenomic studies that were going on and said, hey, there are tons of sequences, environmental sequences, that we don't link to any known species, but when you put them with a tree, they group with rosella. And furthermore, that the diversity in this clade, which they called cryptomycota, could rival the rest of the fungi entirely. Okay. And they were um, considered intermediates because when they did all this cell biology and they stained for chitin, um, which would be this, but let's not even go through the micrographs because um, they, were, they were accurate. But they didn't find any evidence that the cells that they probed with nucle nucleotide probes um, that were cryptomycota had any chitinous cell wall. So here's this sort of group at the base of fungi that does, isn't able to make chitin. Okay, so if that were the case and we wanted to include cryptomycota in the fungi, we'd have to redefine what we call fungi because if they're not going to have chitin and then we also know that they might have phago, uh, phagotrophic ability as this pac manning and I was telling you about, um, then you know if we're going to include them, we have to totally redefine what we consider fungi. So then um, I showed up here in 2009, and all this sort of was going on, and we knew about these cryptomycota, and everyone wanted to sequence rosella, um, and the cultures that I used as a postdoc were gone. Uh, unfortunately, the guys at Berkeley didn't have it, the guys at Duke didn't have it, they were dead. So um, that's when entered uh, Courtney Fry, who was my first uh, Europe student, and I told her, you yeah, know, if you come to lab, we're going to, you know, discover a novel phylum. Uh, in, in <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, well, we were beaten to the taxonomic punch, but she indeed was able to get the only culture of that phylum, you know, in the world as far as we knew. And she had that by winter of that year. And then we established a genome project and 
nailed down the relationship between Rosella and Microsporidia more or less. So um, they were indeed at the base of the fungal kingdom. This is the outgroups here. This is the first branch, and we had pretty good support um, and that these two were clade. Okay, you look through the genome and you try to find some synapomorphies, some shared derived genomic characters that you would love to see, unite them, and you don't see a lot, mostly because it's a story of loss. These things get rid of genes because they don't need them anymore. They're dependent on the host. But one thing that they had acquired was um, this very interesting um, set of genes, or actually it's one transfer of a nucleotide transporter gene. And they've taken it from the chlamydia, which are intracellular bacterial parasites. And we showed that Rosella also had this horizontal transfer um, through some some biochemical studies, this gene that's in microsporidia is shown to have the highest affinity for ATP. So we consider that these, these guys are essentially energy thieves. And when you see them in the host cytoplasm, they seem to be drawing the host mitochondria towards them. So they're actually siphoning off the ATP from the host. So then there was this thing about chitin synthase. And so are the cryptomycota not at all able to make chitin? Do they not have a chitinous cell wall? Well, the genome is very easy to answer that question. And, and actually, Rosella certainly had plenty of chitin synthase genes. And we had the culture, so then we were able to do some of the staining with WGA, wheat germ agglutinin, and show that actually th this part that um, has chitin that stains the most brightly are these cyst phases. Okay? So they stain very brightly. They have a chitinous cell wall. And the, the, um, the um, stain is really strong at the in infection peg. And what we, what we, th I think we've identified is an actual synapomorphy for cryptomycota and the rest of the fungi. And that is a chitin synthase gene which has a myosin domain, okay? And myosin is basically a motor protein and it allows molecules to traffic along the actin cytoskeleton. And so what we think is that this chitin synthase is sort of being, is trafficking along sort of like the um, pseudopodia of, of these pre-amoebae and, and essentially allowing this apical growth. So it's, it's a lot, the, the ability to grow in a polarized fashion is linked to the presence of this gene. And that's exactly what fungi do, which is to grow through their food. In Rosella, it's limited to just this stage here. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of these stories, and I, I'll just throw this one up here. Um, you know, they're basically stealing nucleotides from their host, so essentially all of the genes that you would expect to see in the de novo synthesis pathways are gone. They don't need to make their own nucleotides from scratch anymore. Okay, so um, we see that there's a ton of diversity out there. We know almost nothing about what it's doing. Um, and so what are we doing now? Um, we know that you can take water and you can filter it. And when you do, you get tons of these uh, DNA sequences. So we're using single cell genomics now. And the basic idea is we sample, say, um, pond water. And we'll run it through um, a micromanipulator or flow cytometry is what we're focused on. And then get individual cells, amplify their um, genomes, the entire genome, test them to see if they are cryptomycota. And then if they are, then we sequence their genomes. And then we'll do this sort of reverse ecology approach, which is to say, what can the genome tell us about its role in the environment? Okay. We're just now getting our first genomes of cryptomycota through the JGI. And we're also using these clade-specific primers to sequence and do metagenomics. Um, and this work, I should um, acknowledge Alicia Quant has been, uh, is a postdoc in the lab, and she's leading this um, charge. And with uh, great contributions from John Marino, former postdoc, Katie Lazarus, an undergrad, former undergrad, Alan Longworth, and Ellen James were also undergrads. And um, just point out, there are since you know this Rosella publication, there are two other things that are described, and they're really cool. Just want to share the biology of them. One of them, Mitosporidium daphne, is basically um, it's only known from the gut epithelium of daphnia, 
okay? So it lives as an intracellular parasite of the gut epithelium of Daphnia. And then another one which Alicia has already generated the genome for is um, it's a parasite of the nuclei of free-living amoebae. So they have these extremely cryptic parasitic ecologies. To kind of summarize what I think it is about being a fungus is that, you know, you have this sort of phagotrophic ancestor. Chitin was brought in to, to essentially provide this um, turgidity for making spores, you know, get shot away. Um, but then that was co-opted um, with this, the acquisition of the myosin domain to do um, polarized growth. And then fungi took off on polarized growth. And you can imagine sort of like that infection peg of rosella turning at into chytrid rhizoids and eventually that turning into a, a proper mycelium. Okay, so that's the first um, story. And now I'll transition into part two. Um, if anyone has seen the movie Natural Born Killers, one of the um, catchphrases was that the media made them superstars. The idea that, you know, this sort of epidemic of reality TV was taking off and, and you know, um, publicizing, like, you know, um, murder mysteries and such. And um, we also have an epidemic in our field, which is hype, you know. And um, there's a lot of hype having to do with these two parasites. And, you know, how much of it should we believe and how much of it is media distortion? So um, I'll just throw that out there. Um, here's an example of uh, some, some serious hype, uh, cover of Nature, Fear of Fungi. And in this, um, you know, they basically explain in this paper how fungal pathogens are emerging, and we don't actually have a great reason for why. But the, the ones that are emerging are these um, generalist pathogens, which means they have a wide host range. And many of them have what's probably an environmental reservoir or even the ability to grow saprotrophically, but they choose to parasitize. So the one that we study is uh, the amphibian disease. And um, a little bit of the biology, it specializes on the keratinized parts of amphibians. It has an extremely broad host range, over 500 species, with these um, red dots being records where it's been recorded. Um, so essentially everywhere, it somehow doesn't like it to be too hot, so it's not known from sort of lowland tropics. You can collect it in the field on larvae, and you can pull off their mouth parts, very cruel, but it's necessary for science, and see that um, regions are depigmented where the fungus has attacked it. And that's a, that's a fungal, um, fungal lesion, so to speak. And, um, and then it can be cultured. It looks like a proper chytrid. And what it does to the adult is um, grow in the skin, the upper layers of the skin. It causes hyperplasia. Since frogs respire through their skin, it probably has some toxicity as well. And they take up water through their skin. It's really bad. That's a kind of a very important organ for frogs. And the, um, the fungus is very fatal if you do infections in the lab. Okay. So, um, when I, when I was an undergrad, I started uh, a project on the systematics of Chytridiomycota. And I can tell you there were probably about five people who gave a damn about that subject. Um, even, you know, in, when I started my PhD. But in 1998, this, this um, pathogen was described, and it was, you know, a Chytridiomycota pathogen. Then all of a sudden, the group became much more important. Uh, and my main collaborator on the systematics was dragged in real deep to this um, amphibian disease research. And um, after we were, we had been doing systematics, but she basically asked me, can we use some of these molecular tools to address whether or not there's pathogen sex? And okay, that's an interesting question for evolutionary biology, but also we, um, we thought it was important for the epidemiology because where there is pathogen sex in where there's sex in chytridiomycota, you always see the, the production of a resting spore, and that could be a dormant stage that could facilitate long-distance dispersal. 
So I, I, w I was very um, interested in the project, and, um, but I also thought that what we really needed to do was to, to use population genetics to test this idea of is this a pandemic or is there some hype going on? I mean, is, if this really is a recent pandemic, we ought to be able to see the signatures in the genetics. So bottlenecks um, and range expansions and all that good stuff. So, and, and for me, this has basically been sort of a murder mystery um, that we're trying to solve. Um, and this, this slide is, 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 is summarizes three papers. And, um, oh, I need to go back. Well, Erica was, was this the, un, um, the high school student, actually, who, who did some of this very first work. And what, uh, basically, right off the bat, we sequenced a, a global set of strains. There was no variation. So it had, actually, this very clear evidence of a bottleneck. And it had some things that we were very surprised. It had fixed heterozygosity, which meant that most of the loci had only heterozygous individuals, which is completely inconsistent with sexual reproduction. So it was something that was more consistent with uh, clonality. And so very little variation. And um, the second study used a bunch of microsatellite markers, but they only had two alleles per locus. So again, we had this real smoking gun that there was this very recent um, expansion of the disease. And I became thoroughly convinced you know, that this was real and it wasn't a bunch of hype. Um, and, and so we kept digging through to try to find more variation to see we could say something about geographic origin. And we start to se sequence um, 11 KB of mitochondrial DNA in a bunch of isolates, not a single polymorphism. So this thing is a very recent coalescence of the entire pandemic. Okay. Um, but it was actually really boring at that point because we can say anything except, oh, it's very, very recent. So even the frogs are getting bored at this point. <laughs> and just to summarize, just the lack of pattern. Um, you have this, this you know, dendrogram, which puts these strains I in groups. And the colors are geographic location. And there's hardly a pattern at all. And then there's cartoons for the hosts. And there's really no pattern at all. So we weren't really able to say anything about origins or specificity or coevolution or all that fun stuff. So that's why it was boring. Um, but there is variation here. I mean, we're making a tree, so you're going to have to explain what is, wh why do you have variation to make a tree? And so I'm going to try to do that in a bit and tell you about how and why it got really exciting. And um, the first thing that happened was sequence. And of course, uh, get a lot more data, sequence genomes, and things actually start to figure out what's going on. And then the second thing that happened was, you know, just roll up your sleeves. Get out there and culture more isolates. And that's exactly what we did. And so um, what I want to try to put forward now is that this chytrid pandemic is caused by a single hypervariant diploid clone that generates most of its variation by mitotic recombination. OK. So I first um, opened the lab in 2009, and I got was um, contacted by Lisa Schlegel, who was doing her PhD on the role of the trade in frogs on the spread of chytridiomycosis. So she had this project, and she had isolated these strains and wanted to genotype them. And we started collaborating and going to markets and, um, and collecting isolates from the frogs that are in the market. And so um, we had no, you know, meaningful variation until we s basically struck gold here in Ypsilanti. Um, we cultured from a bullfrog and put this in the phylogeny, and boom, it was completely different than anything we had seen before. OK, so interesting. Where did that come from? It didn't come from Michigan, actually, because all of the frogs that you see in these markets here in the United States, they're North American bullfrogs, but they're farmed in foreign countries because of the way the economy works shipped live, and Lisa showed that they were almost all infected with the disease. So the main um, countries that were exporting these bullfrogs were um, Taiwan, Ecuador, and Brazil. And so we did what um, 
a lot of people are doing now is to sequence the food. And so we sequenced the frog that we took the culture from, from Ypsilanti, and Lisa went to uh, farms in Brazil and Taiwan and was able to make a match, more or less, with um, a Brazilian farm. Okay, so this basically got us into thinking that this genotype probably came from Brazil and that we ought to start working there. And Brazil is an amazing place, especially when it comes to herps. Um, our work is focused in the Atlantic coastal forest, and it has at least a um, thousand described species and is the most biodiverse region in terms of amphibian diversity. Um, and, and so I want to acknowledge the, the good people involved here. Um, this has been a project between the U Michigan group, which has these wonderful students involved, and um, Felipe and Domingos are our Brazilian collaborators, and um, Kelly is our, our um, kind of our ringleader, uh, whips us into shape when we're getting out of line. Um, so oh, uh, the lot, it took us about three years, but we completed a transect throughout the Atlantic Forest. And um, we were trying to trace back, did that genotype come from Brazil or not? Indeed, we were able, in, in three of our localities, we were able to find that genotype in the wild, okay? So we do believe that um, there is this endemic genotype that's highly restricted to Brazil, okay? And so it's, it's restricted to this region in the southern forest. and the the rest of the sites only have this genotype that is seen throughout the world, okay? And we have this one very, very interesting region here in the state of Paraná, where, um, near, the, near Mohetis, where we find actually evidence of hybridization between the global strain and the Brazilian strain. So we'd actually finally found the evidence for sex, and it was just kind of just right there in our face. We found these very clear hybrids. Um, this is ongoing work uh, with Tommy Jenkinson, and I'll, I'll let him finish this story when he defends. Um, so I'll, g I'll switch on to the genomics aspects then. Um, I'm not really going to run out of time, so um, I, I'll, I'll, I might be a little superficial because I do want to get to the third story. We developed this optical map, and it allowed us to see what the chromosomes looked like in, in, in the fungus. And we um, basically were able to start looking at entire chromosome uh, maps of the genome, OK? And what I'm going to show you in the following um, graphs are plots of heterozygosity. So this is just um, distance along the chromosome. And then on the Y is proportion of heterozygous bases in a particular window. So um, when you compare humans, you get you know some similarity, but the peaks just don't overlap, and that's because of recombination. Normal obligate recombination shuffles the underlying haplotypes, and you don't get the same peaks. But in BD, you don't get that. You get totally different appearance. Okay, and so. Um, what we observe is that we have identical heterozygosity profiles across groups of strains. So this set of peaks is all the same across all the GPL isolates. These set of peaks are all the same across BD Brazil. And that's because the underlying haplotypes are exactly the same. Then we have these, this obvious bit, which is long tracts of homozygosity. And um, we have retention of heterozygosity near the centromeres. So what's going on here? There's clearly some loss of heterozygosity. And we can actually explain it all as a process of, of, of crossing over in mitosis, actually. So uh, we can imagine a heterozygous genotype that looks like this. We have crossover that happens in mitosis, depending on how the homologs line and separation. The daughter cells have lost heterozygosity distal to that breakpoint. So mitotic recombination recombines the genotypes, but it, it sort of strips away heterozygosity. All right? So it's an interesting process. 
um, we can sort of leverage that to look at the underlying um, haplotypes without having to deal with phasing these diploid genomes. So we take a bunch of strains which are homozygous for the tip of this chromosome and we make a tree from it, okay? So we just use this region of DNA here that's all homozygous. We basically get one of two alleles. And what this tells me is that essentially the ancestor was, you know, diploid, heterozygous for these two. And what's important, and I didn't point out, is that each one of these is formed for a different recombination event. They may be nested as well, but anyways, these are independent events, but the underlying haplotypes are revealed once that homozygosity occurs, and there's only two haplotypes. So this is why we believe that all that GPL, you know, global pandemic is a single diploid clone. Okay, so our lab has seen a ton of mitotic recombination and, and it happens not only in this pathogen, it happens in candida albicans and other pathogens. And we're interested in is it actually adaptive or is it more like this random mutation that has no benefit to the organism. So we tried this experimental approach um, where we took the hy a hybrid genotype and then we basically um, put it in media and asked if, if we, you know, select on it to grow as fast as possible, will it change? And will it undergo loss of heterozygosity that's adaptive, that we could see as parallel changes in independently evolving populations? Um, and thanks to uh, Thomas Jenkinson and John Recknagel for their help with this project. Um, and let me try to explain this figure here. So this is the entire genome. The, and these are five strains. Uh, one of the of our strains, one got contaminated, and, and one we just were too lazy to sequence. But um, here's the ancestor, and then there's a four clones from the evolved population. And where it's green, it's still heterozygous. Where it's blue, it's homozygous for the Brazilian allele, and where it's red, it's homozygous for the global allele. And you can see that the the ancestor was actually homozygous at a number of of um, regions already, but in the evolved we found evidence for some evidence for parallel evolution, of loss of heterozygosity on chromosome 16, and then in this strain loss of heterozygosity on chromosome 8. And it's not necessarily, um, and then here as well, there's not necessarily a very clear pattern, but what we are definitely seeing is that when there is loss of heterozygosity it seems to be biased towards retaining the Brazilian allele rather than the global allele, as if the global allele is costly. So to summarize, it's not really the epidemiology, you know, I started off a not a believer that chytridiomycosis was as important as it is, and I would say from the population genetic perspective and being in the field in Brazil, I would say it is the real deal. Um, but I'm interested in the process of recombination and pathogens. I think this is a, my model of what's going on. You have basically this heterozygosity is generated by sex, um, and that essentially allows things to, to move up this, poten this evolutionary potential ladder. And now they have a genome that's got heterozygosity, and it could undergo loss of heterozygosity. And our question is, can it make essentially increases in fitness by this loss of heterozygosity before eventually it runs out of heterozygosity to play with and mutation catches up with it and then it has to undergo sex again to purge some of these bad mutations. So that's essentially the model of what we think is going on. So just to finish up now on this part three, um, opportunistic fungi. They don't want to kill you, they didn't evolve to kill you, but um, they just happen to have traits that are really bad for you. And um, the host being weakened is a general, um, is a general um, characteristic of them, but it, it selects for sets of pathogens. So for example, those fungi that can attack homeotherms have to be able to stand uh, 37 and greater. And if you have a yeast phase, you can disseminate much easier. And these are important as well. So Cryptococcus, which is a fungus, is, you know, the fourth leading cause of mortality in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is because of um, AIDS. And they're generally super fungi. So they have these sets of properties that allow them to infect the host opportunistically. 
So what are they? So mycologists are trying to figure out what are the sets of traits that will actually allow it to, to be so successful in this scenario. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae is certainly not what I intended to um, be studying. Um, it's not what most mycologists study, but after you know, knocking at NIH's door for a few years asking for money to study amphibian disease and re mitotic recombination, I gave up and um, went to the awesome power of yeast genetics. It is an opportunistic pathogen of some importance. So about half or 1% of all yeast infections are actually from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And there are some cases of invasive infection that are known, okay? Um, and our system for studying this, path this pathogen is, is um, interesting. So we use waxworm larvae. And um, here are some control larvae we've injected with PVS. And then here are some that we've injected with Saccharomyces. You see they very quickly, within two hours, they melanize or they form this pigment. And then there's just some mortality curves that show that it, Saccharomyces can actually kill it when you inject it into the, into the, um, the worm. So there are um, a great many people who have worked on this project, and I have to mostly thank uh, Sujal Fadki and Serena Zhao um, for their great work on this. Um, so does this system work to identify alleles and genes that are important? So our approach was to basically take barcoded yeast strains that each, each strain was individually barcoded and there was a marker. And, um, and then we did this experiment with wild strains. And I, I have to absolutely thank um, Callum McLean, who's a postdoc in George Zong's lab, um, for his great help on all of our yeast work as we we're transitioning. It's, it's, it's pretty embarrassing to be a mycologist and to have to be asking other people for how, how to work with fungi. But um, he, he is definitely a, a great resource. Um, so each, he, he's the one who barcoded each one of these strains individually, and then we passed them through um, the worm, and then we had to have these control in, in, in just a rich medium because the problem was we inject in the worm, and then we grind up the worm. It's not natural transmission at all, and we couldn't recover enough, enough cells, so we had to grow them up a bit in, in the rich medium and then inject them and so on. We did that for 10 passages. And um, then we did uh, another experiment where we took the entire deletion collection, which is also barcoded, and, and did a similar experiment. And that was a collaboration with Anuj Kumar. Um, so here's what the data look like. Um, here's, here's our initial populations. We did this over 10 passages. This is in the rich medium. So these are the 42 strains. After one passage, we see some change. But um, you know, most of the strains are still there. But by the fifth passage, we have these two strains that are mostly winning out. And, and by the end, there's only really around three strains left. Um, and then we did the same thing with the worm. There's something interesting happened. After the first passage, we had one strain that really took off in all the replicates. And then by the fifth passage, it was more or less gone. And then the tenth passage, there's only two strains left. So there is a common strain between these two. But this strain that is different, this purple strain, was very interesting. We thought maybe we had something because this strain was a clinical isolate. Okay, so maybe there's some properties of this strain that are important. You know, are those um, sorts of isolations indicative of anything in terms of their ability to survive in this system? So if we would imagine the clinical isolates are all super, super strains that are able to withstand this really harsh environment of the worm, they would do well in that environment. But um, indeed, they can't. So in this axis, is just a selection coefficient. And so um, the zero, if, if they're above the zero line, they did better than average. Okay, and We have these a few winners here. But by and large, the clinical strains are not winners. And um, you don't see a very clear pattern when it comes to the, the um, source of isolation and their ability to thrive in these environments. Okay. Um, and then the deletion collection. So in, in this plot, essentially, the things that are up here did better in YPD. Things that are down here did better in the worm. And so what we would take home from this is that there, um, these genes, so each one of these spots is one of those mutants. These genes here are basically um, essential for growing in the worm. 
And when you delete it, it's no longer able to, to survive in the worm. And um, I haven't really um, baked these results down, but Sujal has analyzed it and said that those genes here are enriched for mitochondrial encoding genes or mitochondrial functioning genes, genes that function in the mitochondria. So that's basically the end of the third story here. And um, we have developed this system, and it, w it allows us to basically study pathogenicity and mitotic recombination. But what does it all mean? I mean, you know, this it couldn't be any more artificial, you know. So I think we can leverage it to some degree. And if we combine a better pathogen, so cryptococcus, and passage it through these worms, we'll get a, a better response. We'll have more variation that's meaningful. And then we're also starting experiments, which are being led by Lucas Michelotti, on essentially putting the yeast in more normal environments. So we've got it basically evolving in beer and wine <laughs> and um, salt and, and asking, you know, is mitotic recombination adaptive in this scenario? And I definitely have used up all my time um, on these three vignettes, but I'll just close. I want to do something. Maybe it's, it's a little, um, a little too selfish, but I want to just share my own personal highlights of this first seven years, and um, uh, teaching mycology and surviving for the first time uh, was really great and had an awesome experience. Um, we did John Cage performance. I teamed up with um, School of Music. Do a walk in the forest. Definitely discovering the BD um, Brazil genotype. Um, I probably should have saved this specimen for type collection, but you know, <laughs> the hell with it. It was tasty. Um, then you know, getting that rosella and, um, and, f and seeing those you know resting sporangia in the stereo microscope was just amazing. And uh, a lot of credit to Doug Jackson, who was basically uh, collected in this. You can't really see it, but this is a drainage ditch there the side of the interstate in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, and sequencing the $50 uh, fungal genome, it is absolutely um, possible now, um, but there are certainly hidden costs. Um, and finishing digitization of all the macrofungi. Um, I certainly want to thank Matthew Foltz for, for leading this. He's an amazingly organized guy. Um, here's a specimen from Waymire. Thanks also to Pat Rogers and, and, and Rob Powers. Um, three field seasons in Brazil. It's been, it's been really fun to see this place. And, and this is the hybrid stream here where we've collected the hybrids. Um, too hard a river burn. I think you know the picture says everything. Um, <laughs> and uh, becoming the Lou Waymeyer uh, and Elaine Prince Waymeyer Chair in Fungal Taxonomy. It's an amazing honor and privilege. And then um, uh, teaching this workshop in China, um, not because of the actual workshop itself, but because of getting to meet this really awesome woman. And um, then, of course, uh, the, the, the joy we get from this child. So um, with that, I'll just um, like to give a few shout outs. Um, uh, well, Dermot, thank you for making the Weimar thing happen. It was really awesome. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Deborah and Paul Berry, who were sort of um, early on very um, welcoming to me and made me feel um, really at home here. Um, thanks to Priscilla Tucker and Mark Hunter, who were my um, faculty mentors in the early days. Um, Alex Kondrashov and Lacey and Joe were great friends when I was uh, just getting here. And um, the amazing staff and you know how well they are. Um, and the students, of course, the graduate students in the program, I, I, I do enjoy being around you guys a lot. And, and mo but most of all, you know, my, my lab group um, for all the fun that we've had in the last seven years. So um, thank you all for coming to this talk. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah, Darren. I, mean, I know that this is just the particular project, this work and I'm working on many others. So, uh, which is really remarkable. I mean, just the pure research that you're, that you're using in this group. But if you want to borrow that, what's the largest unsolved question in, in mycology? 
<laughs> all these three that I just <laughs> talked about. Um, well, damn, that's a good question. I think, I think we are, uh, we're really struggling to get at fungal ecology because we can do a great job at, at grinding up dirt and sequencing the hell out of it. And that's super cool because we're still in the golden era of, wow, this is so cool. Look at all this data. Um, but, you know, that's it. You know, we, we in terms of getting to the next level of what's really going on here, um, we don't, you know, it's hard to make that next leap of the functional consequences of diversity. Um, and I think that for me, that's like the main question in mycology. Uh, and I'm not an ecologist, so I'm probably not going to play a major role in solving this. But um, yeah, why Q? Yeah, well, calibrating will be nearly impossible. And we also have this problem of the organisms that they parasitize are not the same that they did, you know, probably a billion years ago when they first branched from the rest of the fungi. So I remember I had my poster in the hall of, um, you know, in Duke, and um, you know, John Taylor came by and he was like, eh. Rosella and Microsporidia at the base. Parasites always go to the base. It's not possible because you know they're parasitizing extant organisms. So how they you can't put the you know the egg before the chicken or whatever. And um, well, the truth is that they've parasitized different things in the past, and they've now transitioned onto things like vertebrates. And we've certainly nailed down that relationship. And it's at least I would say it's probably a billion years old. But you know, molecular clock estimates are going to be all screwed up because the rate of evolution is just, you know, super accelerated in some of these branches. They've lost some of the genes that really slow down sort of the cell cycle and replication checkpoints and stuff. So it's going to be a very hard problem. But I'm I'm sure it's, you know, all of these diversifications happen in sort of marine, you know, before there was really any good life on Earth. Yeah, Barry. Great question. Uh, I think I think I would say maybe about a thousand a thousand sequences per gram of soil. We don't know if they're active or just spores that are floating around. And um, I would say you can get down to family level most of the time. I don't know the exact number of OTUs or uh, the exact percentage where you really can't say anything. Um, there, you know. Some of the problems is that we are biased towards what we've already seen. So we have, we've developed these primers to target, you know, off of the, the sequences we already have. And so they did this massive soil survey, and they, you know, had they recovered 80,000, I think, OTUs around the world. And s most of them could be linked down to an order, but um, a colleague of mine, Leho Tetersu, is now trying to figure out where they go in the tree, and I'm working with him, and it seems like. We're going to probably establish, you know, thing new classes of fungi, um, but in terms of major phyla, this d discovering major phyla of fungi, this method doesn't work too well because it's biased towards what we already know. Um, yeah, Chaka.
Yeah, um, we, we try to apply all the same ones, biological, morphological, ecological, and but mycologists sort of reject most of those as having not worked too well. So we basically mostly use a phylogenetic species concept. Yeah, um, which is because the morphology is just, you know, misleading um, usually. Yeah, Deborah. Yeah, so um, I wouldn't. I didn't really want to show this because of I already packed too much in. But <laughs> there's a bunch of um, of, n of discoveries because people did what we did and they went out and cultured stuff. Um, and there's now a sibling species that's known. It's only on salamanders. There's our Brazil. It's restricted to Brazil. There's a, there's this Korea specific genotype which is completely different. It's strained from. Um, from Switzerland and then one from South America, or sorry, South Africa, and then there's the global thing. So yeah, there are, there are a bunch. Is it 